let us turn, uh, turn to Acts chapter 10, verses 24 through 43. That's a lot. We'll read this responsively. Um, if everyone has turned, Acts chapter 10, verses 24 through 43. I will read first. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of, of, of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is, all, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no par partiality. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to, ju to be judge of the living and the dead. Amen. At this time, Pastor Johansson will come up. Uh, let us look at the screen. I prepare a picture to see. Okay. Who do you see there? You don't really see who I am pointing at, right? Uh, we got like three, 13, 14 kids. And all I see is the one in the middle. Who is he? He's my son. Uh, why am I showing this picture? Now that you guys don't really know where to focus, right? It's just a bunch of kids. You don't really care, right? But there's one I do care. I don't care about all the other babies' face. But I care whether... My son is smiling or not, right? The reason I'm showing you this is because that's how God is looking at us, right? Out of all the people that he had called us, that he only focuses on us, that he looks at us. No, it's not a bunch of people that he doesn't care. It is you who's there among all the people that he cares the most. What does God do? He, he focuses when we have five minutes of our summit time. Our summit time is different from any other religious acts. It's different from Buddhism. It's different from Muslim. It's different from all other religion. But it is the summit time that God is focusing. 
And it is a sometimes different from all the other meditation, all the meditation that religion have. But this is sometimes that God has granted us. Why is he focusing us? Because in Philippians, in our meditation, we don't focus to solve the problems. We don't focus to, we don't focus to fix others. In the summertime, we focus on God to be found in him and to know him and to understand his power and his might. When we focus, because this is so different from any other religious acts, all the other religion offers you. God focuses on us because why? We are the children of God. Isn't that great blessing? You know, our meditation could be ignored. Our prayer could not be heard to God. But He's listening to us. He's focusing us because simply we are called as children of God. So we count, as, count everything as lost to be found in Him and to know Him. And verse 10, it says, to, that we may know the power of His resurrection. And we also share His suffering. So the focus of our meditation, the focus that God, is, God has regarding our meditation is not us, but it's on Him. And when we focus on Him, that's when we're able to see us. We can't see our face without reflect ourselves. You know, once we're born, we have never seen our face, right? Unless we're looking at mirror. How can we see our spirituality? How can we know who we are? How can we know where we are? How can we know where we're directing to? Only when we look at the mirror of the gospel. And when gospel shines upon us, that's when we get to realize what's on my face, how I look like, where I'm going towards, and what I am doing, whether I'm lost, whether I'm found. We are found in Christ. So in meditation, we go into the Word of God. We're not falling into our own empty word, but we're falling into the living word of God. We're not falling into just saying, you can do it, just do it. You will be able to do it. You will complete it. You can do it. We're not focusing on that. We're focusing on the word of God. In the meditation with God's word, we experience the mystery of prayer. We understand finally the power of the prayer. We now know and understand and God starts to give us faith. Prayer works better than your own efforts. Prayer goes in God's plan more than you try to put yourself in God's direction. Prayer is a mystery of our walk of faith. And God opens a door. Our lives To evangelism. Nowadays, God has granted me grace and faith that I start to really believe when I have five minutes of summit time, God opened the door to evangelism. I really start to believe when I pray, when I meditate on the word, God sent his angel to do his will, to carry his word. God really gave me the word and gave me the faith. When I am in the summit time, he really breaks force of darkness. In my summit time, I experience true comfort. In my summit time, I experience true peace. In my summit time, I see the darkness gone, Satan is broken, and God does his new work in my life. Before I'm doing anything else in my summit time. When the word speaks to you. God's throne establishes on you. When we come into the prayer. He let us experience. Power that goes beyond our time and our space. Our thought and our mind. 
when we are in summit time, he opens my life. Not only the evangelism, your finance, your studies, your success, everything that belongs to you will be door to to 37 nation. We don't believe in success. We believe in God's plan that's beyond my success. So our goal is not simply accomplish what I desire. Our goal is not simply having marriage. My goal is seek God's plan beyond what I can do, beyond what I do. And God will definitely open the door to, to 37 nations because he focuses on your prayer. He hears you. And he's looking at your meditation. He understands your heart that is in the word of God. He understands your faith in Christ. While we meditate on the word of God, when we pray, we fix our eyes on Jesus. This is a mystery of meditation. Not on my problem. Not on my darkness. Not even on your spiritual problems. Not even on your difficulties or situation. We focus on Jesus. And the Bible, Hebrew chapter 12, verse 3 says, Jesus is a perfecter of our faith. Jesus is founder of our faith. So the perfecter, the founder of our faith, start to complete our faith. Start to finish our walk of faith. Start to perfect our work of faith, our, uh, our faith in Him while we fix our eyes on Jesus. When you start to fix your eyes on Jesus, you're not bothered. When you start to fix G your eyes on Jesus, it is okay. So can we repeat after me? I am okay. And you're okay. Everything's okay. Can we bless the person next to you? Just looking at their eyes, it's okay. You know, this morning, you know, we have two remnants, they're brothers. And one has one wore um, glasses, the other <laughs> took off glasses. And always the older brother, the younger brother has a tendency, he wears glasses always like this. And then he's looking at people like the up and <laughs> like this, right? And the older brothers, he's getting always annoyed. He's like looking at his brother, hey, hey. And you know, younger brothers, like, he's like, he acts like he's doing it. He's like just touching his glasses and then <laughs> let it go. And then the older brothers getting annoyed, hey. And then brothers, didn't you see me touching my glasses? And he's answering like this because he didn't put it up. And after the brother left, the younger brother left, I asked the older brother, what bothered you so much? What is the problem with that? Nothing is a problem. It's okay, right? Are you guys okay? Right? I'm okay. You okay? Everything is okay when we fix our eyes on Jesus. How is he completing our faith? You know, our faith is really small. Like, let's compare our faith to each other. Like, who has bigger faith? Let's compare our faith to God. Is our faith bigger than God? Can it be even greater than God? I mean, how small is our faith? But if God starts to work on our faith, if he starts to complete our faith, what will happen? How is he going to complete our faith? He promised us he'll be with us to the end of years. This is how God completes our faith. By being in us, he's completing and he's accomplishing our faith in him. He's by the guidance of his spirit. He's completing our faith, <coughs> accomplishing our walk of faith. By work for us, work through us, and work <coughs> by the work of the Spirit, 
we will experience how God is completing us. It's not me finishing my race of walk of faith. It is God who's completing us. So may we experience God is with us. That's it. Nothing bothers you. Nothing can bring you disaster because we received the word today. We are the one who blocked spiritual disaster when God is with us. So can we bless a person next to you again? God is with you. And tell them, don't forget, God is with me too. God is with us. <clears throat> How does Jesus work when he's with us? He works in power with spirit. In, chapter, in Acts chapter 10, 38, we read, Jesus with power and spirit heal those who are oppressed by the devil. People are not oppressed by their mental states. They're not oppressed by their reality. They're oppressed by the work of Satan. People are oppressed not because of their environments. They're oppressed by the work of Satan. The devil is oppressing every mankind. But what did God Jesus do? He heals doing the good things with the power and spirit. Heal those under the oppress of the devil. He will surely heal us when we have, when we're in the summit time. When he's with us, he is healing us with his power, with his spirit. What is What is my spiritual disaster? Uh, I want to say this is our spiritual problem too. What is mine? And do we know what is my spiritual problem? Many times we are very blind to my spiritual digester. Why? Because we are comforted with my problem. It's been a long time that I've been that way. You know, people have, kids have season of their life. You know, when I started to do my ministry, um, pastoral ministry with adolescents, my first church that I went to, I was charged for the kids uh, aged between 14 and 18. 14 and 18, people say they're adolescents, they're going to puberty, right? And then the problem was this, though. Problem is not that they're going through puberty. Problem is that people just justify all their acts just by saying, they are puberty. They could be very rude. And it is us who should simply understand them because they're puberty. Oh, they're not even focusing on worship. They don't even come to worship. They play game and we justify them. Oh, it's because they are in puberty. And in Korean, they say it's junipyong. What's junipyong in Korean? Uh, in English. Puberty. Disease of adolescence? How do we call it? It's disease of seventh grade. So I told them, if you if you identify them as disease, we gotta heal it. Instead of simply justifying whatever their work with the word puberty. If it is disease, we must heal it. But many times. This that we have is also with you in the world of idols. And do we like, do we really like for God to take away my idols? Do we love it? Do we really love God to take away my money, my love, my rules? Do we really accept him? Who might break every part of my life? Spiritual disaster that we have, we are tainted living in 
that time. We're tainted living like that. People now are justifying their depression, saying I'm depressed. So you got to simply understand my depression. They are tainted to live in depression. They don't even know how to be out. And in, in fact, they gave up. They simply accept life is suffering. Can we look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 22 to 23? My spiritual problem, my spiritual digester, it says, it is according to the human precepts and teachings. Uh, referring to the things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. And this has been with us for a long time. Right? God will break our prejudice. He will open our eyes to where we are blinded. He will take away our, our idols. And he will give us strength to overcome my limitation. He will surely do it. This is our belief. When Jesus works in power in spirit, he will break our digest. He will block the spiritual digestion that's been on us. And I want to say, he will heal our spiritual digester. Why did I put our spiritual digesters? What you're going through, you're in the flow of this age. You're in the flow of this nation. You're in the flow of this state. I realized, uh, I watched the news. The Chicago has been found, um, found the most corrupted city for three consecutive years. That's the flow of cis Chicago. Maybe that's the flow of our life. That's the flow of our spiritual reality. What is our spiritual digester? Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. This might be your tradition. It's not that Peter only considered pigs as unclean. It's his tradition. It's his family. It's his people. It is not only him, but everybody around him consider pigs are unclean. So it is our tradition. It, is, it has been written to us as a rightful thing to keep it, keep it in our mind. This is our culture. Idolatry. Some kinds of spiritual digester have become our culture. Colossians chapter 2, 20, uh, 2, 8, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to elemental spirit of the world, and not according to Christ. When, the, it, when our life is not according to Christ, your tradition of your family might be idols. The states... The city, the rules that you're facing, the education you receive might be idolatry, might be spiritual digester. When we're in some time, Jesus with his power and spirit will liberate us, heal us from our spiritual digester. Reason I told you guys in the beginning it is okay is because many times it's not okay. And what did Peter say to Cornelius? He said, it's unlawful for the Jew to associate with Gentiles. What is unlawful to you? What do you self-restrict it from yourself? What do you self not accepting God's work in you? What is unlawful work of God that keep tells you or keep wakes you up? What is unlawful as a president, uh, as a gift of the birthday? Yes, today is my wife's birthday. 
you know, birthday, I always buy uh, ice cream cake and flowers, of course. And what might be the unlawful gift that you'd give to your wife, right? You know, I, I wrote in the letter to my wife, I told her, I know we will have 70 more birthdays for you. We'll have 70 more birthdays of you. So I don't really know what to give it to you. I think, you know, it's easy to give a special gift one time. But if you're living the rest of 70 years for your one person next to you, it's your agony. It's really an agony to do. What am I supposed to do? So I really, I broke my thought of giving, giving, her, giving her a present. My traditional present, present must be uh, expensive or must be something she likes must be or it must be cash that was my limit of my thought of giving a gift but this week for the first time i i prepare a gift which was free but i gave to her for the first time which might be unlawful to you to prove um, maybe your husband or wife will not like the present but I prepared it, wrote it in the letter, gave it to her. You know what I gave it to her? I told her, from the beginning, we married for word evangelization. So I prepared this gift. I prepared evangelism material. <laughs> and put it in between the letter and gave it to her. And last night, before going to sleep, I asked her, did you like my present? Uh, my, my, my present? And she said, it's cute. <laughs> I feel like she doesn't really like it. But what I'm telling you is what is unlawful to you for the work of the gospel movement, for the evangelism movement, right? I try to give every special thing, but for six years we've been married. I haven't given her evangelism material. So for the next seven years, now I know what I'm going to give. Now I'm set on gift that I will give. I will make maybe a special gift of evangelism or something else just for her birthday every her birthday will be a door to evangelism amen so that'll be your next gift for your birthday do you like it yeah why not this is how we break their spiritual Digesters. When God breaks mine, He breaks ours. He breaks their. When we have summit time with power and spirit, He will heal us from the oppression of the devil. He will heal us from the oppression of the devil that was upon our family, our family line. Now where we, where we are, we will be able to block the spiritual digester of this age, this nation, this state, your family, and your school, your work. Jesus will work in power and spirit. Amen. So let us focus on God's absolute plan. <clears throat> Yesterday was raining, and you know, there, there was a lightning yesterday. My son was so scared. And he was so scared that he would be in my embrace. And then he would go to um, his grandmother. Grandma is so scary, scary. And, you know, we told him Jesus is the Christ. And I wonder what my mom would say to my son. What might be a good advice, not an advice that we desire. What might be a good answer to my son about lightning? And my mom told my son. The Bible said Jesus is Lord of all, right? My mom told my son, God made lightning. And that was the answer. And you know what he realized? I am son of that God who made lightning. You know what that means? Lightning cannot destroy me. Because my God, my Father, created lightning. What's God's absolute plan in your mistakes? 
Aren't you so caught up in your mistakes? You know, many times we think because of my mistakes, something has done, been done in the wrong way. Are we, caught, are we regretting of things that we've done yesterday? But what is God's plan? If God is a master of your mistakes, is God destroying you or is God recreating you? What is God's plan in your mistakes? In the word, God will give you the answer. This week, we moved, finally, we moved to our house. And, you know, we called the moving company. And they were working, they were moving, and then, you know, I, I supposed to pay this amount of money, but I'm so stupid, I paid $100 more. And, you know, I wanted to call them, hi, uh, I think I gave you $100 more. Guess who's going to say, that's right, you gave us $100 more. So we'll, who do you think will say that, right? No one will say that. I made the mistake of losing my $100. So what I did, I went to the word of God. This month, Remnant Day, Pastor Liu in the introduction said, give your hand to those who are in need. So I realized, wow, God unintentionally used me to give $100 more to those who are in need. Your mistakes. What do you find God's plan? Uh, what is God's plan in the word of God? What is he saying about your mistakes? Is really your mistake going to destroy you? Is it going to destroy you, Sam? Is your mistake really going to destroy your family? Or what is God's plan in it? If, God's, it is, if God were to be the master of your life, master of everything, he's the Lord of all. What is he doing through my mistake? And when you accept your mistakes as God's work, you know what we're able to do? We're able to understand and we're able to heal their mistakes. When you see others mistakes, aren't you getting mad? Aren't you looked down on them? Or aren't you just scared to face them again? Are we falling into our failures, worries? But when we know the Lord has his hand over all, the moving company, I found out yesterday, I found several holes in my house. They were never there before. I made a mistake, so why not? They put the mark of Jesus in my house, everywhere. Am I happy? I am. It's okay. <laughs> I'm okay, you okay. So next time, I'll definitely, I realized, oh, I should have given them. I should, I should have started this moving thing with a prayer or by giving the evangelism material. But I realized, no, I didn't. So God is reminding me. His absolute plan. Am I losing? Am I gaining? I'm gaining God. I'm gaining the word. I'm gaining Christ. Isn't that enough for us? Right? What are the problems are you facing? I know we try to solve it right away. But what is God's hidden but absolute plan in my problems? If we were able to find God's plan in my problems, we are able to find God's plan in their problems too. Everything is a platform to come near to the word. To spread the word of God. What is God's plan in your problem? Don't simply judge a problem as problem. What is God's blessing that's hidden in the problem? Your failure. What is God's absolute plan in your failure? If you find God's absolute plan, you'll be able to find God's absolute plan for those who are in failures. What age are we in? We're in an age we make fun of those failures. We're in the age disregard failures. We're in the age praise only the elite, the success. We are losing the heart of God. But what is God's absolute plan? In my failures. Instead of judging yourself. By saying. Oh it's because I haven't studied much. That I failed to pass this test. 
Or instead of just saying, because I didn't study much, I, wa I wasn't able to go to good college. What is God's absolute plan in your failure? If we find God's plan in my failure, we're able to find God's plan for their failure. They're not people to be disregarded. They're people to be saved. What is God's absolute plan? So today, we celebrated one of our senior deaconess uh, for 80 birth, 80th birthday today. And as I watched it, I asked, God, what is your plan? What is your plan for this um, birthday um, ceremony, birthday, like 80 birthday um, party? What is your plan? And today's message was about every meeting, right? And it looks like this birthday party was for her herself, but it's, it's, it was for the kingdom of God because when I meditate on the word, as I listen to the pastor's message, he reminded me, who are the audiences? Like, who are the participants of the parties? Not our church members. Now, they're coming to our churches for the birthday, but they're coming to our church maybe for the first time to listen what? Listen to the word of God. Right? That's when I realized, oh, we might need to throw some kinds of party like that, even at church. Because we are able to bless our meeting in the name of Jesus Christ. So let's look at Romans chapter 16, 19 to 20. Verse 19 to 20. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. It says, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. In your meeting, may you be wise as good. Uh, may you be wise as to what is good. In your meeting, innocent as to what is evil. And the Bible says the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Amen. In every meeting that you have. Just like Pastor described to us today, in between the meeting of Peter and Cornelius, what is my meeting? What kind of meeting do you have this week? May we find, may we be wise to good, be innocent to evil, so may God crush Satan under our feet. When Satan is defeated, his kingdom is upon us. When throne is in us and upon us, around us, God will start to do the evangelist movement in our lives. So in every meeting, may we disregard our hidden motivation, wise, wise to what is good, innocent to what is evil. Uh, lastly, one thing that I, I want to share, I met this one of an uh, elder at the church, not our church. Uh, he's a businessman in Hong Kong. And I, when I met him, I asked him, is there many pastors or is there, like, is there any church members or is there, you know, people come to you with heat of motivation? I asked them. And he said, of course. Because he's a successful businessman, they do come before him. You know, just like Pastor Shin today said, saying that, oh, Sam, let me do the tarapa. Let's say Sam is, a, Sam is next son, next son in, in, that, in Korea, like, He's a U.S. citizen. So I'm next son in American. And he's really rich. And he's amazing that I came to him to do the tarapang. I'm telling Sam, we need to do the tarapang. And after finishing tarapang, asking him, Sam, I need $100. Right? I come to him for the hidden motivation. So I asked, asked the elder, elder, um, how do you know whether they come to you with hidden motivation or not? And he said, it's so easy. Because in the world, that's all I do. Right? You know, you, you're able to deceive someone. We can. They're there forever their lives. 
they only meet people with their heat of motivation. They know just by looking in your face, you're coming for your reason, not for, some, not for God. You might say it's for God, but they read your mind, right? He said, we are expert in this. To do my business, pastor, you got to be an expert. Hiding your heat of motivation, taking money off from others. You got to be good at this. So how would I not know if a pastor comes to me with a heat of motivation? Or if someone comes to me with their own dream in the back of their mind? May we be wise to what is good. Be innocent to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And may we experience this blessing as we have a meeting, of, meeting this week. And let us have a time of prayer and praise. Speak of Christ, will not share his life. Why should I? Oh. 
of Jesus Christ, Christ, the love of our Father God, indwelling guidance and working of the Holy Spirit upon the remnants, upon every evangelist who desire to be in five minutes of summit time, who desire to seek your plan in every meeting, who desire to know God's absolute plan, now and forever. <laughs> 